Welcome, everybody, to our latest um, uh, Friday happy hour. Uh, hopefully, you're uh, all situated nicely to enjoy a good conversation and participate through uh, Q&A uh, with the cocktail of your choice. Um, uh, unfortunately, I do not have one in hand right now, but I certainly will later today. Um, so I'm joined here uh, by Mark Finley and Jim Crane, uh, two of my colleagues who have been uh, been in this same environment with me a couple of times to talk about what's been going on in oil markets. Um, and it's, uh, it's no less interesting today than it was a month ago or even two months ago. Um, it's interesting to sort of watch the headlines uh, about what's going on in oil markets. And uh, it seems like every day there are multiple headlines that speak to prices rising or prices falling, bearish versus bullish activity. Um, and uh, these headlines will sometimes be published within an hour of each other. So um, it really speaks to the uncertainty, I think, that is uh, still present in the oil market as we begin to uh, move forward from the doldrums of April 20th, where we hit minus 37 and change at, uh, for the prompt month at WTI. So um, what we're going to do here today is I'm going to pass the, uh, pass the baton over to Mark. He's going to uh, make a few opening remarks and then we'll pass it over to Jim and he'll make some opening remarks. Uh, and then we'll just get into a conversation and address the questions as they come through from all of you. So, um, I hope you came armed with questions because, uh, we're certainly, uh, uh ready to engage. Uh, with that, uh, Mark, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Ken. And thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, I hope you and your loved ones are all keeping well. Uh, I'm joining you today, not really, but from my background from uh, Diria, which is uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the ancestral home of the uh, House of Saud. Um, then we'll, we'll come back to the topic of Saudi Arabia frequently, I'm sure, over the next uh, hour. Um, it's been an eventful six weeks since we last spoke you know, for the oil market. I think it's safe to say that we've seen the worst of it, as Ken mentioned, but what a worst it was. You know, and as Ken mentioned, you know, the price of WTI, the US benchmark crude, briefly went below zero for the first time ever for a few hours. Prices have recovered and now stand today around $35 a barrel. That's the highest we've seen since the price war broke out in March. Moreover, after trading at record discounts to Brent, the international benchmark, uh, which, by the way, did not go negative. Uh, the WTI Brent differential is now trading at more normal levels. And furthermore, future price expectations, which also had been showing massive dislocations, with current prices trading at massive discounts to prices just a few months in the future, that few, those future prices are now essentially flat. Um, on the demand side, we're clearly seeing a recovery as economic activity resumes here in the US. The latest DOE weekly data shows that demand is about 2 million barrels a day above the low point that we saw in mid-April. Interestingly, all of that net recovery among all the different types of refined products, all of it has been in gasoline. But this recovery is tentative, two steps forward and one step back. And that's the way this is going to be going forward, I think. You know, the weekly demand figures here in the United States have actually fallen in the last couple of weeks, even as gasoline has continued to recover. Relative to where we were before the crisis, gasoline demand here in the US is still down by about 25%. Jet fuel, which had been down 80%, is down about 50%. Diesel fuel, uh, which in the early days of the crisis actually held up pretty well, is now down about 20%. Perhaps again, an indicator of weakening underlying industrial activity. By the way, these swings in demand have really forced the US and global refining system to be creative. Here in the US, refineries are built to make gasoline. That's what we do. Uh, before the crisis, nearly two thirds of the output of US refineries was gasoline. Less than a third was middle distillates, primarily diesel fuel, but also jet. Um, as gasoline demand collapsed while diesel demand held up in the early days of the crisis, refiners reacted by dramatically reducing their gasoline yield. It fell from about 63% to about 43% in the space of about four or five weeks. Diesel yields, on the other hand, grew from about one third to about 40%. Now, with gasoline recovering and diesel weakening, 
Refiners have once again had to adjust on the fly. Gasoline yields here in the US are back up over 50%. Around the world for oil demand, it's the same story. Demand is coming back, but remains well below its pre-crisis levels. In China, which was first into the crisis and the first out, demand is almost all the way back, except for jet fuel. And moreover, it turns out that the collapse in oil demand worldwide may not have quite been as bad as we originally feared. The International Energy Agency had been estimating that demand would decline by 23 million barrels a day, or nearly 25% in the current quarter. Now, in its most recent monthly update, it only, only expects oil demand to decline by 19 million barrels per day. It's worth noting though that for the year as a whole, the IEA is still projecting an all-time record decline of nearly 9 million barrels a day in global oil demand. Uh, that's three times bigger than the previous all-time record decline. On the supply side, we're very clearly seeing strong reductions in global oil production. This month, the production cuts, the, the biggest production cuts ever agreed have taken effect. Early indications are that compliance looks good from the OPEC plus group, that is OPEC and cooperating countries, including Russia. Their agreement aims to reduce supply by nearly 10 million barrels per day this month. Compliance has been helped by the fact that Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries say they're actually producing nearly 2 million barrels per day below their production targets. Now, Jim will speak more about what's going on in the Middle East. I'll simply note here that the Saudi GCC under production suggests that these countries really want prices to continue their recovery. Oh, and by the way, it further shows that this is not about gaining market share, at least not for right now. Now, on people on this, as people on this call know very well, the US supply response is also very clear. The latest weekly DOE data says that US crude oil production has fallen by 1.6 million barrels per day. That's the fastest non-hurricane decline ever seen in US oil production. And many analysts actually believe that the, US, that the US Energy Department is not picking up the full extent of the production decline. That is, that it may be even bigger. In addition to crude oil declining, US production of natural gas liquids is also declining, as is production of biofuels, although the latter has begun to recover a bit with gasoline demand. Now, here in the US, most of the, most of the declines so far have been due to operators choosing to shut in existing production as well as, uh, as oil prices fell below operating costs. In Texas, estimates are that as much as a million barrels a day of production could have been shut in. And North Dakota's regulator says that almost half a million barrels a day of production in the Bakken is also shut in. One interesting question, I think, is when or if that production comes back now that prices have recovered. I think Ken may have some thoughts on that for us when we get to the Q&A. In addition to shutting in existing production, we've also seen a collapse in the rig count. In a little over two months, the Baker Hughes rig count for oil rigs in the US has fallen by two thirds, a breathtakingly rapid decline. And this will of course have a drag on future production prospects. By the way, it's important to note from a policy perspective that all of this US response has been driven by market forces. You know, despite a lot of talk in Washington, Austin and other state capitals, there's been no direct intervention by federal or state regulators uh, in these production decisions and the supply response has not been limited to the United States. In Canada, Alberta's regulator says a million barrels a day of the province's production has been shut in. And we've also seen large scale shut-ins of production in Brazil, Norway, and elsewhere. Yet even with these responses, the demand recovery, sharp reductions in supply, the global market still looks to be in surplus. Last week, US commercial inventories increased yet again to reach yet another all-time record level. But globally, fears of hitting storage limits have disappeared. So where do we go from here? Attention now turns to when the market will move from surplus to deficit. That is, from when inventory stop growing and start falling. Some analysts think it's already happening in China. Remember, first in, 
to the crisis and first out. Depending on your views of demand recovery, OPEC compliance, and U.S. supply, most analysts think that that transition for the world as a whole will happen sometime in the third quarter. But massive uncertainty around this. The biggest one, remember, I've said all along in these calls, at its heart, this is a demand shock. So the biggest uncertainty to me is where do we go on the demand side? How deep and how long is this impact? And the factors range from the economic factors that come into play, policy responses, as well as changes in personal behavior. Um, you know, the bottom line is, do we have a V-shaped rapid recovery or more of a long drawn out impact on demand? On the supply side, I think the two keys are OPEC plus and the US. The OPEC plus group next meets on June 9th and 10th. And here is a potential challenge. The current agreement calls for production cuts to moderate in July from about 10 million barrels a day currently and in June to about 8 million barrels per day. But press reports are already saying that the Saudi GCC block wants to extend the current cuts beyond June, while Russia wants to stick with the current agreement. That sounds to me eerily familiar to where we were right before the price war broke out in March. I mean, you remember at the OPEC plus meetings in March, Russia wanted to stick with the current agreement while the Saudi GCC bloc pushed for more aggressive cuts. Now, I presume that the experience of the price war will push these interested parties to find a workable solution. Here in the US, I would ask two questions. Does shut-in production return? And what happens to investment in drilling going forward? Some people think that the return of shut-in production, now that prices have recovered, could actually offset the drilling-related declines that are coming in the next few months. Um, and some people think that investment will rebound quickly. My personal view is that while the oil is still there, financing is going to be a significant challenge going forward. And moreover, unlike in the last downturn, the industry is going to likely find it much harder to maintain its competitiveness by driving large cost reductions and productivity gains. A brief word on the longer term, of course, this remains at its heart a cyclical industry and we're merely setting the stage for the next cycle. The International Energy Agency reported this week that they expect global energy investment to decline by 20% this year with the biggest impact on oil and gas upstream investment. And within that, of course, the biggest impact is right here in the US. All that canceled investment will inevitably reduce future supply. As I've mentioned uh, earlier, one key issue is what happens to shale production, but also remember that OPEC will come out of this crisis with lots of spare production capacity. On the demand side, there's lots of talk in Europe uh, about using the crisis to advance green stimulus as a way to speed the transition away from fossil fuels. By the way, as an aside, I'd also note with interest that India has chosen to raise taxes on fuel as oil prices fell. But here in the United States, China and other emerging markets, the places where the future demand action is going to be, there's been less focus on green stimulus, frankly. And the other question is, will this experience durably change consumer behavior? Less flying could reduce future demand, but also less Willingness to ride public transport uh, and more use of personal cars could go the other way. We are already seeing that, in fact, happening in China. Let me stop here. I look forward to the Q&A, but before that, Jim, over to you. Okay. Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of big crooked numbers there, Mark. Uh, uh, super interesting stuff. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks, Ken. Um, and everybody for listening in. Uh, it's great to see you all again, uh, even virtually. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but uh, stay in the same theme here and talk about, let me talk a bit about some scenarios for interplay between OPEC, OPEC plus, uh, and, uh, and the U.S. shale sector, um, sort of looking ahead. So this market share conflict uh, that, that Mark alluded to, uh, you know the, the the price war that we saw very briefly uh, and disastrously uh, that ended this month at the start of this month. It, 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 some of the underlying factors I think have not yet been resolved, uh, and with shale poised for a comeback as uh, as oil prices rise or a potential comeback, we'll see. Um, 
we could see some of this uh, uh, revived, right? So shale production, uh, some 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 data from Restart Energy uh, I saw was suggesting that the shale production could bottom out uh, in June, so next month, and then rise from there. Uh, and as Mark mentioned, ironically, OPEC is meeting that bit right around the same time, so around Ju June 9th and 10th. So if there's no meeting of the minds uh, among the three big producers, the Saudis, Russians, and the United States, there is a chance that we may see uh, a, a some kind of a preemptory action from uh, from OPEC on to 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 undercut a shale revival. Um, uh, so so let me kind of walk through the logic of uh, of this, and and hopefully some of you will argue with me over this. Um, so shale's current business model looks problematic over the longer term. I mean, this the business model was already being challenged by investors who were demanding higher returns rather than just more oil coming out of the ground and capital flows into shale were already dropping and it was looking like 2020 was going to be a year of rationalization even before the coronavirus hit demand. Um, IEA is showing that investment into shale is, 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 is dropping the most right now. So it, it's hurting, um, uh, you know, uh, about 50% uh, a drop in investment. Now, there's no doubt that the, you know the, the, the revolutionary technology and the advantageous market design uh, in the U.S. Is, has really given shit, you know uh, pushed shale to these uh, uh, unheard of heights and and allowed the U.S. to be this brief net exporter and potentially still the number one producer globally. Um, but to to my mind, this involved some dubious strategy and tactics and even some some somewhat ugly uh, uh, nationalist politics that, um, that we're not so used to in the US. Um, so is it realistic uh, to the think, you know, if, you, if you think about it from the OPEC perspective, is it realistic that these unconventional sources in the US are going to dominate the, even the largest conventional players with easy oil uh, uh, like Russia and Saudi Arabia and some of the others in the Middle East? I think from their perspective, that's a no. Um, and that, uh, you know, they see shale having ridden to the number one spot on the backs of OPEC's cuts, where these far better endowed producers, and at least, you know, in, in the conventional sense, made collective sacrifices in the interest of raising prices and, you know, uh, if, 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 you, if you believe it, in stabilizing markets as well. Um, so shale didn't share in those sacrifices, of course, and you know, and 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 not only didn't they share in them, they swooped in and 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 kind of reversed their effects and took uh, took market share while they were doing it. Um, so, and there's also uh, the notion that that shale gets some competitive advantage by ignoring developed world environmental practices, standard practices like not flaring or venting unwanted associated gas. So, so neither of these practices, either the, the free riding or the ignoring of environmental norms, to me, represents a viable long-run strategy. You've got climate change, of course, since that's global, uh, you know, one would think the world would eventually triangulate towards the lowest carbon intensity oil uh, for its long-term requirements. And, and at least for now, that oil is outside uh, the United States, um, uh, contrary to what you, uh, you sometimes hear. So, Let's turn to OPEC now. So we've got Saudi Arabia looking to most likely extend these, these nearly 10 million barrels a day in cuts. And as Mark mentioned, they're also even going beyond their, their allocation and focused on price right now, of course, right? So all these big, uh, you know, sort of one track economies that, that are dependent on oil are really hurting right now uh, and really want to get the oil price as high as they can just for, for their own uh, fiscal well being. Um, so, as you know, Mark was mentioning the sort of interplay between the Saudis and Russians. Russians are saying, "Yeah, let's let the the, the cuts kind of uh, uh, begin to phase out in July." Saudis like, "No, let's let's try and keep them in place till the end of the year." Um, you, you know, Russian companies. There's one. You know, uh, uh, in the press today, uh, one of the Russian companies says, "Actually, if it adheres to the cuts, it's going to be unable to meet its own sales contracts." Right. So there's there is some some tension there. Uh, but on top of all this, the OPEC plus countries are all too aware that U.S. shale producers 
have captured almost all the, gr the growth in global oil cons uh, consumption in five of the last eight years, right? So great, a great article this week uh, it, it, you know, that Reuters put out, John Kemp. Uh, he wrote that uh, the Saudi Arabia and OPEC Plus only managed to either maintain their market share or recover it in three of the last eight years. And that was when Brent was at low prices, on, under mostly under $50. So while the loss in US oil production of you know, one or two million barrels a day by, by June, maybe even slightly more than two, that looks like a, a disproportionate, largely large sacrifice on behalf of US producers. But, uh, uh, and the, you know, the US is, US producers are shouldering some of the burden uh, in the market. Those output cuts could be re re reversed as soon as oil prices hit a certain threshold. And for some companies in the US, it's already hitting that threshold. So 30 to $35 is high enough uh, a WTI price for, for some companies to get, to get back to work. So OPEC's efforts to raise oil prices through production cuts, if they push it too long, it could be setting the cartel up for another one of these major sessions of market share. Um, and we saw that in 2009 after the price decline in 2009 and after the, the price decline in 2014. OPEC and Riyadh and, uh, really waited too long before resuming full output. Um, and, you know, they're chasing uncharacteristic, unreal, unrealistically high prices, right? And the Saudis in particular uh, really set off the process that allowed, that left them handing market share to the competition. Um, so I don't think that Riyadh and Moscow are going to just patiently stand aside and watch that same movie again, right? So that price war that we saw earlier this year, definitely ill-timed, but ill-informed, maybe not. Um, uh, so uh, I think, you know, when OPEC meets in June, uh, they're going to have to decide whether to, 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 to roll those cuts over or start tapering them off. Now, of course, demand is, is going to be the most important metric, as Mark mentioned, but OPEC Plus is also going to want a view on shale, I would think. And, you know, as I mentioned, shale bottoming out in June, uh, 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 resuming uh, uh, growth potentially um, right around the time OPEC meets. So it's going to be a tri tricky call, I think, in that June meeting. Um, bigger picture for the Saudis, I think, and I'll end on this, uh, 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 this, this point here, is, is that uh, I think, and, and also, you know, more worryingly, uh, is that, um, you know, the U.S. is now a serious global competitor to Saudi Arabia in the oil sector, and that is putting the U.S.-Saudi relationship on some slippery ground. Um, now, Saudi Arabia understands this and is, 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 is cautious about it. I think, you know, it's, it's starting to become clear that M, the, the Crown Prince, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, may have hitched his uh, his fortunes maybe a little too tightly to to that of President Trump, and and and, and uh, uh, you know the, he he could be hurt depending on how the U.S. election goes. Um, but um, overall, I see sort of two rough pathways for how this could um, proceed. Uh, you know, just from just in the oil market side. Um, so so first, some type of rough consensus over price and output among the big three producers and. And how the U.S. would meaningfully participate in that is unclear, given our the structure of our, our oil sector. But it, it could just mean this consensus path could just mean that the Saudis and Russia's, Russians articulate output targets and maybe a price band. And that would signal to U.S. producers that too much output from shale uh, is, is going to come up against uh, some resistance. Second option, more of a geopolitical one, um, U.S. producers might appeal to American politicians to threaten Saudi Arabia with the retraction of U.S. military protection if the kingdom's market tactics leave insufficient room for U.S. oil, right? And we saw this uh, during the price war. You know, President Trump got on the phone and read the riot act to, to MBS. Ted Cruz threatened the withdrawing U.S. support, and there was a, a pretty threatening letter from some, some, some senators. So, so we might see if this, if we go down that road, you know, the, the Saudis sort of forced, if you will, to subsidize shale with, with output cuts in return for continued U.S. military protection. Um, that might work in the short run. Longer term, I think it would would undermine this longstanding U.S.-Saudi relationship. 
Saudi, Saudi and its neighbors would continue to, to, to reorient themselves even more closely to, to the East. Um, and, uh, you know, U.S. influence would, I think, continue to, to dissipate uh, in that region. So long run, uh, maybe it's better to, to talk about these things than to, uh, to, than to walk alone. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mark. Um, we've had a few pretty good questions come in that that uh, kind of leg into some things I was going to raise anyway. So I figure uh, I'll just kind of uh, mash a couple of them together and, and get y'all's uh, thoughts and reflections. And, you know, uh, one question that I'll ask that combines a few that have come in that I think <clears throat> um, leverages your comments really well, Jim. And I know Mark uh, from stuff that we've done together, uh, you'll have something to say on this as well. So um, in particular, there's a there's several questions sort of looking at <clears throat> OPEC plus, uh, how important is it going forward, whether or not uh, U.S. producers should seek ways to cooperate uh, with that broad um, uh, group of producers, national producers. Um, and then ultimately, uh, you know, how important is such cooperation? Um, one, one, uh, one viewer even asked the question, how critical is the U.S.-Saudi relationship? Um, uh, which I think is something that has been on people's minds for a while. Jim, you and I wrote some stuff addressing the Carter Doctrine and what shale has meant for um, sort of the evolution of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and what it likely will mean going forward. But um, uh, all of that, I think, sits very well against a general question about break-even prices for U.S. oil versus oil produced in a lot of the OPEC uh, plus uh, member nations. So I know that's a mouthful, um, but I think you both uh, could sort of chime in, and I'll, I'll certainly do so at the back end. So, um, uh, Mark, you want to take the first cut, and then we'll go to Jim? Oof. Um Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's clear that U.S. strategic calculus has shifted and it's moved so fast. I think a lot of geopolitical and strategic thinkers haven't been able to keep up with it, frankly. I mean, the, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. self-sufficiency in oil has been an objective of every president since at least Richard Nixon. Um, and we had it. Um, and, you know, that, you know, in the space of the last decade, the U.S. went from being the world's biggest net importer to being a net exporter. Um, you know, that has profound geopolitical consequences. And I think it's fair to observe that the, um, you know, the strategic uh, calculus hasn't kept up with the facts on the ground. Um, now, important to recognize that those facts on the ground can change pretty quickly. For example, guess what? The United States now on the most recent weekly data is back to being a net importer. So uh, yeah, uh, energy dominance was good while it lasted anyway. Um, so, so, you know, things can change. I think my thought would be a um, policy uh, needs to be robust across, you know, all of these, this, this unpredictable and highly variable set of out outcomes. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, is important to U.S. strategic interests for reasons beyond oil, uh, Iran, uh, Middle East policy more generally, Israel, proliferation, terrorism, take your pick. Um, you know, how does oil rank among those others, I think is a fair question to ask. Um, you know, but it's also the case that even within the oil market, Saudi Arabia has outsized uh, importance, not just by virtue of the size of its production, but because it alone in the history of the planet, as far as I'm aware, has invested to maintain a buffer of spare production capacity, um, you know, to be used, you know, in the event of an emergency, um, to, you know, to the event that other producers hold spare production capacity, um, it is not a matter of long-term strategic intent, but rather tactical, um, you know, moves within, you know, for example, the OPEC plus framework that we're seeing right now. But on top of all of that, you know, Saudi Arabia has invested in it in an additional buffer, you know, and has used it in crises in the past. And that I think that spare capacity and the strategic maintenance of it gives Saudi Arabia a strategic importance to the oil market that extends beyond, um, you know, U.S. standard, uh, U.S. Um, you know, considerations and beyond, um, you know, the tactical. Let me. I'll weigh in on that too. I mean, you know, I, I totally agree with, with everything you said, Mark. 
I mean, I think as long as oh, oil. No <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but uh, as long as oil is a strategic commodity and Saudi Arabia can, maintains that spare production capacity, maintains that importance in it, that, that we're going to, we're going to be, uh, uh, you know, they're going to be in a, it's going to be important to have a, a strong relationship with them. Um, on the, the other question on talking to OPEC, should the U S talk to OPEC? Maybe I'll take a stab at that one. Um, mm. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, when it comes to push, you know, push comes to shove, does America really want a free market in oil, right? Do we really want a free market in oil? I don't think we do. Okay. Now, if you do, um, we shouldn't talk to OPEC, right? You just keep on uh, uh, basically free riding on, on their cuts. Um, but if we do that, eventually, I mean, the one thing that makes oil special, oil market is special because it has the, that rent component, that really durable rent component. And, and that's why, you know, the, lots of businesses, including lots of them here in Houston, are in that business and not in the renewables business or some other business because those profits are outsized uh, in, in, in rent. And, and there are, uh, you know, if, if there's more competition, you have a, an absolute free, um, um, you know, global market in, in oil, it's not constrained by uh, producers taking, you know, actions to constrain their production or to deliberately underinvest in their massive cheap reserves. Um, eventually those low cost producers are gonna rise to the top and the competition would drive out the, the rent component, right? So um, to me, it seems like the constraints that OPEC is puts on on supply, which are well known, but the other one is the deliberate underinvestment by con countries with huge reserves, right? Um, you know, if countries with huge reserves wanted to, they could meet all global demand with cheap conventional oil and the price would go much lower. But those constraints, to, to my way of thinking, are just as important to US oil producers in keeping shale viable as the technological advancements and in, in, in the market, you know, the US market structure. So, you got it. So, so if you if you really want a free market in oil and you want to have have unbridled competition and 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 push these um, these big producers to 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 drive down the price and ramp up their production, you may not have such a such a large U.S. oil uh, sector or even one at all. You know, if it if it really gets competitive. So, I'd so I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on that to kind of address the, some of the questions that are coming through that I referenced regarding break-even prices. Um, uh, one even came in on, um, you know, fiscal break-even for places like uh, Saudi Arabia. So maybe, uh, Jim, I know you and I and Mark have all talked about this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just make a general comment about it and then uh, let you guys uh, weigh in. But I actually had uh, the, the, the discussion about fiscal break evens for places like Saudi Arabia and, and other large oil producing uh, countries. That's been going on for decades. Um, uh, in fact, I had a uh, uh, one of my research associates um, back in uh, 2009 um, do a little digging. Uh, of some old literature uh, that had been published on fiscal break-evens and what that likely meant for uh, presenting stressors in places like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, could it drive civil unrest? Could it drive a collapse of the political system, et cetera, et cetera? And um, it was kind of remarkable because um, the doomsayers for those countries have been present since at least the mid-1980s. Um, and all of those countries are still, you know, largely intact with similar types of government architectures that they had back then. So I think that speaks to the resilience of the enterprises, the resilience of the political systems that are in place there. Um, and it also, I think, throws uh, at least a little bit, uh, a little bit of cold water on the discussion of fiscal break-evens, um, because there are abilities in all of those countries to adjust either through austerity measures or other things. So, um, and I know, you know, Jim, Mark, we've, we've chatted a lot about this and um, uh, I'd love to hear your comments on that. But before that, I just want to make another comment. There's, uh, there's generally a, a, a question that, that's come up a couple of times in the, in the Q and A um, that's been coming across uh, and in the chat even um, uh, regarding the breaking of break even price of shale. 
and you know when will it start to recover um uh, and in some cases uh some of you wonder if it ever will um particularly if there's a large uh, swath of bankruptcies well a couple of points on that um the rock is the rock it's not disappearing um what's ultimately going to drive investment back into the sector is uh the rent uh, uh the returns if you will that you can generate um in the sector and that's largely a function of price but also the cost of the operators that are left standing so what what kind of operators can move in what sort of capital efficiencies and scale efficiencies they can bring to the field um, and, you know, as we move through, uh, uh, you know, this uh, downturn, uh, I think one of the things that's going to be interesting to watch is how many of the large healthy balance sheet players actually do absorb some of those um, distressed assets and turn them into something that looked totally different than what they looked like uh, in 2019. So um, I'm not one to write off the shale sector uh, because of that. I actually think there's still latitude for improvement. Um, and I think we're going to see that as, as the sector continues to evolve. Jim referenced in his remarks, um, uh, you know, as we exited 2019, there was a general consensus building uh, due to a lack of positive cash flow generation over the last decade or so for a lot of operators in the shale space, uh, that this was going to be a year of reckoning um, anyway. Uh, and in many respects, if you accept that view, then what COVID does, this massive demand shock, it, um, uh, uh, it effectively has hit the accelerator on, on that whole process. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out. It might actually end up being that we go through a period of just intense, incredible pain in the oil sector. Uh, but uh, in many ways, it might be like pulling the Band-Aid off real quickly. Um, and you could actually see the sector uh, recover quite robustly as, as prices recover. Now, of course, contingent on that statement is price. Um, $35 is not really enough to attract a lot of capital back into the sector, um, if any. But I think once we start to creep up over 40 and, 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 and beyond, you'll start to see, uh, you'll start to see some, uh, some uptick in drilling activity, which I think will be interesting to watch what the implications are for, um, for oil market balance. But before we move on from there, I wonder, Mark, Jim, if you want to comment on the break even, uh, the fiscal break even discussion. Well, I'll, I'll weigh in on that real quick. Um, I mean, the, I, I, I agree, you shouldn't put so much uh, emphasis on a fiscal break even. The one you often see for Saudi Arabia is $80, for example, you'll see, you know, $100, $120 for Iran or Bahrain. Um, uh, that's a, the price of oil um, uh, that they need for their budget to, to, to actually be fully funded, right, for their government budget. That's the, what, what we're talking about here, right? Um, if, if we have to imagine this is, if, if these are, you know, the IMF is one of the inst institutions that produces these numbers. This is a snapshot at one moment in time, right? And, and it fluctuates a lot. And there are many ways of funding a government budget beyond just with oil, right? With oil rents. You can, you, know, you can fund it with taxes or fees. You can raise taxes or fees. You can cut spending. You can go into, you can use deficit spending or go into debt. Uh, you can, you know, issue bonds. You can, you know, launch an IPO of a state-owned entity. Um, you can uh, you delay payments to contractors, which happens a lot uh, uh, in, in, in oil, con you know, when the oil price drops and, you're, uh, and you happen to be working there, you're going to wait a lot longer for your payment. Um, and then there's, you know, even beyond that, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's repression that, that often that ramps up at times like this when there's, if, you know, if there's some social pushback, or social unrest about spending cuts and austerity, you'll, you'll see uh, some of these countries turn to repression. Um, You'll see them use religious signaling and the re religious legitimacy, as you know, especially in Saudi Arabia, where they have the, the, the two uh, the two uh, uh, shrines of you know Mecca and Medina. Um, and you see them turning even to you know to nationalism uh, and trying to rally the country around nationalism, just as we do in the in the West, right? So it's so a lot of the same uh, tools, some a few a few different tools, but um, plenty of tools. And these guys, these oil countries, have been through boom and bust many times in the past and they really they know the playbook uh same families are running the place sometimes the same people uh are still running these countries uh, uh you know through 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 many of these busts and they, they, they they've got a pretty good idea on how to stay alive so i'll leave it there 
Um, I have one. My my one thought on the uh, the fiscal break even question is I I've never been a big fan of the concept to begin with because to me it sounds like me going to you Ken and saying I need to make a million dollars a year because that's what my expenses are and the answer is um, as you well know because <laughs> as you sign the paychecks uh, yeah it's like yeah I don't care if you think you deserve to make a million dollars a year you know here's what the market will pay you and it's a lot less than that. Um, and, you know, suck it up and live within your means. And so, you know, to me, saying that the fiscal break even is, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100, that just means you're living beyond your means. Um, and so to me, it doesn't really inform a lot uh, in the conversation is, you know, what will the market bear for what you think, you know, what, what you have to sell into the market is to me the key question. Um, I wanted to also just go back briefly, Ken, to a couple of the questions that came up around you know, the adjustment process here in the U.S. and whether the U.S. should talk to OPEC. And um, I wanted to make the point that while it's a painful adjustment process, um, it, I think the best thing that the U.S. Uh, and the kind of multinational, uh, you know, uh, oil and gas system has going for it is this competitive market. Um, because what it does, man, it brings the cream to the top. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we see that, you know, the, the big innovations, the ability to uh, come up with unexpected answers, you know, they come out of this competitive system. And, you know, for, for people who are watching who are interested, Ken actually gave some, he and I co-wrote some testimony for last month's uh, Texas Railroad Commission uh, hearing, and Ken delivered it along these lines that uh, you can find on our website, you know, making the argument that, you know, competition, you know, it can be painful, but it delivers the best, you know, most efficient and competitive, innovative solutions at the end. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll echo what Mark just said in particular because um, you know if you're if you're wondering if there's proof of that concept, um, the innovations that have spilled out of the U.S. upstream sector have uh, sparked a lot of interest in other places around the world to the point where even countries like Saudi Arabia are looking for ways to um, develop shale resources within their own country. Um, this is not something that was at top of mind uh, 15 years ago. So uh, without a doubt- Deep water as well. Yeah, uh, without a doubt, you know, deep water, the innovations that have been occurring here have definitely spilled out um, uh, and had tremendous impacts uh, around the world. Um, we did get uh, one question come through about, or a couple actually, that came through relative to uh, oil field service companies and what might happen there. And I'm going to just refer uh, those of you who are interested in that to a webinar we had with Andrew Gold and Bobby Tudor that was uh, moderated by Michelle Foss uh, two weeks ago. It was fantastic that directly addressed those questions. So you can find that on our website um, if you go to the Baker Institute's website and go to the Center for Energy Studies, there is a green button on the Center for Energy Studies page called webinars, and you'll find them all there. So I encourage you to watch that. All the webinars are video archived. So uh, that, was a, that was a fantastic session, and, and it will definitely address those questions. Um, there was also a general question about, uh, and I think it's worth clarifying, um, US, uh, is the U.S. actually a net exporter of crude oil? Uh, when it consumed more than it produced. No, that's not actually the case. But the case is, if you go back to 2008, uh, half of the U.S. budget or trade deficit, half of the U.S. trade deficit was actually related to oil imports. Um, if you look at the year 2019, as we moved into the end of the year 2019, that is the only place where there was a significant uh, uh, um a uh, significant shift in the trade deficit. In particular, uh, oil had actually slipped into surplus. And that has to do not just with volume, it also has to do with the price of the types of oils that are being produced because we still do import oil, but large oil import are lower quality, lower priced, heavier barrels. Um, mm -hmm. And then we end up turning those around uh, because we refine them and we are a massive net, net exporter of petroleum products. So when you look at the whole uh, a picture, um, not only are we producing more oil and shipping that abroad, we're also producing more petroleum products and moving those out as well. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's just worth, uh, uh, worth clarifying because it was a good question and, and it was worth, uh, worth addressing. Um, so we are uh, uh, about 45 minutes in. Um, what I'm going to do now, uh, just for the interest of 
uh, time because one thing that I'll just be blunt that we've noticed um, is uh, attention spans begin to start to wane around this time. So what I'd like to do uh, is uh, both uh, give both Jim and Mark an opportunity to make some final remarks on things that they want to talk about. There have been a few questions come across that are very asset specific. Uh, Mark, maybe you can address a little bit in, in your final comments um, uh, the state of the offshore and why, what might be happening around the world in deep water. I mean, I know that there's been some tremendous uh, developments in uh, 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 Latin America, Guyana, Brazil, um, that really do look like really low, qual low cost, high quality uh, assets. Um, one of the things I'll just throw on the table before you go, Mark, is um, uh, the offshore industry has been grappling with COVID in ways that I think every uh, part of the industry has been grappling with it. Uh, it's a massive HSE issue uh, and trying to understand how to uh, make maintain safety uh, uh, and health and safety of, uh, for rig crews when they're cycling onshore and offshore, particularly in areas where um, things are devolving very rapidly with regard to coronavirus is a problem. So it's not just about price. Um, but certainly you'll see companies in those spaces because a deep water development is a much longer time horizon type development. They're going to continue to move forward, I think. So, uh, Mark, you want to make a few comments? Um, sure. I, I guess, uh, uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. What did you say, Ken? My attention span was wandering. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, yeah. You know, between the, the, the question about the deep water, and I can even broaden that a bit more because several people said, gee, you're only talking about OPEC and shale, and aren't there a lot more, you know, conventional, uh, you know, uh, dimensions to the uh, world oil system? And the answer, of course, is yes to all of that. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why we've seen, um, you know, some of the most productive deep water plays, um, you know, continue to move forward in recent years is because, Remember those forces of competition efficiency that I mentioned earlier? I mean, you know, when I when I started working, you know, in the industry, um, well, 35 years ago, deep water didn't exist. 20 years ago, it took a good 10 years from, you know, your seismic to your exploration to your sanction to, you know, having a, um, you know, a specific platform built to your, you know, specifications in the shipyards in Asia. It would take a decade to get first oil. You know, now... Um, you know, all of that has been really compressed. I mean, I think one of the, you know, real lessons of the U.S. shale experience is time is money. And that's, you know, we've seen that put into practice throughout the industry and not just in the shale patch. You know, now you, you can go from, you know, exploration to first oil in, in, in three or four years. I mean, so dramatically condensing the time horizon really works wonders on the, you know, that combined with what we all know is the massive productivity of those deep water wells, you know, has really worked wonders for, you know, that sector's ability to continue to stay in, pro, um, you know, in competitive. Now, like, like shale, there's no such thing as deep water economics. I mean, it's, it's not uniform. There's a massive variety. And so we've seen the best deep water projects with the best terms and the best operators can compete. You know, the ones that can't are really hurting. And that you could say that whether it's true about deep water or conventional resources or shale, um, you know, it's, it's the combination of all of those factors. But at the end of the day, you know, while there's a wide variety, you know, the cream rises to the top. So Jim, for your final remarks, I wonder if you might, because I know you've been given some thought to this. Um, it's going to take you a little bit away from discussing uh, uh, geopolitics, uh, but maybe not so far. Um, the current uh, oil market crisis um, and current economic crisis, because I think Mark put it best, this is a demand shock, right? And so uh, any recovery really is dependent on economies of the world starting to move again. Um, and that affects more than just oil. But I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, and I know Mark referenced it in his opening remarks, but uh, what the potential impact of all this might be on emerging technologies and the, and the, 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 the shape of the energy landscape as we move forward. Well, it's, it's, it's a kind of a wild card because it's, it depends on government policy, right? I mean, um, and so we have to see where it's going to be pushed. I mean, so, so definitely, you know, Europe is pushing this EU. I mean, there's, 
400, 450 million people over there. So it, 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 it'll matter uh, that their, their stimulus is going to have a, a, a green tinge to it, if you will. Um, here in the U.S., I mean, I, I you know, uh, unfortunately, I think it's a lot of it's going to depend on what happens in November, um, and you know, it, 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 and some of the policies that are put in place. I mean, if there's, uh, you know, if we decide to, um, you know, to take climate change seriously and 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 use a, uh, for example, a, a, a carbon tax or you know some type of, of limitation on carbon, you can you, know, you raise a lot of funds through that and fund a lot of, uh, um, you know. I mean, to pay, you know, there's the, the, the proposal where you carbon fee and dividend plan where you return it to 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 uh, to the public. But if you don't return it to the public, it's a huge uh, amount of, uh, uh, you know, cash for for uh, for stimulus. Right. So there could be something like that, there, you know, or smaller, uh, you know, one off projects, uh, whether it's, you know, electrification or, uh, you know, electric transmission or more charging stations or, uh, you know, research and R and D on, on EVs or, you know, more, uh, you know, extending subsidies for wind and solar uh, China, I guess is, is, is another one of these. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it doesn't, you know, from what I've seen so far, the initial, it's not, it's, they're not, it's not a country I follow super closely, but doesn't look super encouraging uh, what I've seen so far, but um, you know, I, I don't know. I def defer to you guys. I haven't seen a lot of green stimulus, green tinge stimulus yet uh, uh, in, in China. So, um, so I guess, again, I think it's, I think it's really a, a, a policy question that depends on, on who's in power. Thanks, Jim. I, I'll, I'll um, just sort of add to that because uh, I do think that is a, question on everybody's mind. Uh, what's what's uh, what's going to come of this as we start to see economic recovery? What kind of stimulus packages will we put in place? Um, how much uh, green stimulus will there be uh, in different places around the world? And um, I tend to agree uh, with what Jim just said. It, it's going to depend entirely on where you are. Um, there's going to be more aptitude uh, or um, uh, um, more appetite, I should say, for green stimulus in certain places than there will in others. Um, there's certainly going to be some pretty intense conversations as we uh, start to see an emergence from uh, this current economic downturn. Um, and I don't want to put the cart in front of the horse yet because we still don't know for sure that we're emerging. Uh, it certainly appears that way, and I hope that to be the case. But um, I think as we do move forward, the Thing that will be on many policymakers' minds, uh, in addition to uh, green energy and green stimulus, uh, is really the fiscal pain, um, and the fiscal challenges that are going to be present as we emerge. Um, and so it's going to create it's going to create some opportunity to do some interesting things. Um, and I think uh, now more than ever, policy will play an incredibly important role. Uh, as we move forward. Uh, so it's definitely an area to watch and one that we will certainly be um, actively involved in and are actively involved in on multiple fronts. So um, uh, stay tuned. That's the best way to say it. Um, uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and in um, uh, the webinar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, apologies if we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Tried to Tried to weave a thread through everything. Um, not always perfect, but uh, uh, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully you got something out of the, the discussion today. I always do. So um, uh, I really enjoy uh, being able to work with Mark and Jim on these types of issues. Um, and uh, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, uh, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Have a good one. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Mark. Hey, guys. Have a great weekend. You too.